The Ichabog, Chapter 3, Death of Seamstress, by J.K. Rowling. The Beamish and Dovetail families both lived in a place called the City Within the City. This was the part of Chalksville where all the people who worked for King Fred had houses. Gardeners, cooks, tailors, page boys, seamstresses, stonemasons, grooms, carpenters, footmen, and maids. All of them occupied near little cottages just outside the palace grounds. The city within the city was separated from the rest of Chalksville by a high white wall, and the gates in the wall stood open during the day, so that the residents could visit friends and family in the rest of Chalksville, and go to the markets. By night, the sturdy gates were closed, and everyone in the city within the city slept, like the king under the protection of the royal guard. Major Beamish, Bert's father, was head of the royal guard, a handsome, cheerful man who rode a steel gray horse. He accompanied King Fred, Lord Spittleworth, and Lord Flapoon on their hunting trips, which usually happened five times a week. The king liked Major Bemish, and he also liked Bert's mother, because Bertha Bemish was the king's own private pastry chef, a high honor in the city of world-class bakers. Due to Bertha's habit of bringing home fancy cakes that hadn't turned out absolutely perfectly, Bert was a plump little boy, and sometimes, I regret to say, the other children called him Butterball and made him cry. Bert's best friend was Daisy Ducktail. The two children had been born days apart and acted more like brother and sister than playmates. Daisy was Bert's defender against bullies. She was skinny but fast and more than ready to fight anyone who called Bert Butterball. Daisy's father, Dan Dovetail, was the king's carpenter, repairing and replacing the wheels and shafts of his carriages. As Mr. Dovetail was so clever at carving, he also made bits of furniture for the palace. Daisy's mother, Dora Dovetail, was the head seamstress of the palace, another honored job because King Fred liked clothes and kept a whole team of tailors busy making him new costumes every month. At the time it happened, only a few people within the city within the city knew anything about it. Though, for some, it was an awful tragedy. What happened was this. The king of Plutonaria came to pay a formal visit to Fred, still hoping, perhaps, to exchange one of his daughters for a lifetime supply of hopes of heaven, and Fred decided that he must have a brand new set of clothes made for the occasion. Dull purple, overlaid with silver lace, with amethyst buttons and gray fur at the cuffs. Now, King Fred had heard something about the head seamstress not being quite well, but he hadn't paid much attention. He didn't trust anyone but Daisy's mother to stitch on the silver lace properly, so gave the order that nobody else should be given the job. In consequence, Daisy's mother sat up three nights in a row, racing to finish the purple suit in time for the King of Plutonaria's visit. And at dawn on the fourth day, her assistant found her lying on the floor, dead, with the very last amethyst button in her hand. The king's chief advisor came to break the news, while Fred was still having his breakfast. The chief advisor was a wise old man called Herringbone, with a silver beard that had hung almost to his knees. After explaining that the head seamstress had died, he said, But I'm sure one of the other ladies will be able to fix on the last button for your majesty. There was a look in Herringbone's eye that King Fred didn't like. It gave him a squirming feeling in the pit of his stomach. While his dressers were helping him into the new purple suit later that morning, Fred tried to make himself feel less guilty by talking the matter over with Lords Spittleworth and Flapoon. I mean to say, if I'd known she was seriously ill, panted Fred as the servants heaved him into his skin-tight satin pantaloons, naturally I'd have let someone else sue the suit. Your Majesty is so kind, said Spittleworth, as he examined his shallow complexion in the mirror over the fireplace. A more tender-hearted monarch was never born. The woman should have spoken up if she felt unwell, grunted Flapoon from a cushioned seat by the window. If she's not fit to work, she should have said so. Properly looked at, that disloyalty to the king, or to your suit anyway. Flapoon's right, said Spittleworth, turning away from the mirror. Nobody could treat his servants better than you do, sire. I do treat them well, don't I? said King Fred anxiously, sucking in his stomach as the dressers did up his amethyst buttons. And after all, chaps, I've got to look my blasted best today, haven't I? 
You know how Drassi, the king of Plutonaria, always is. It would be a matter of national shame if you were any less well-dressed than the king of Plutonaria, said Spittleworth. Put this unhappy occurrence out of your mind, sire, said Vapoon. A disloyal seamstress is no reason to spoil a sunny day. And yet, in spite of the two lords' advice, King Fred couldn't be quite easy in his mind. Perhaps he was imagining it, but he thought Lady Eslan looked particularly serious that day. The servants' smiles seemed colder, and the maids' curtsies a little less deep. As his court feasted that evening with the king of Plutonaria, Fred's thoughts kept drifting back to the seamstress. Dead on the floor, with the last amethyst button clutched in her hand. Before Fred went to the bed that night, Herringbone knocked on his bedroom door. After bowing deeply, the chief advisor asked whether the king was intending to send flowers to Mrs. Dovetail's funeral. Oh, oh yes, said Fred, startled. Yes, send a big wreath, you know, saying how sorry I am and so forth. You can arrange that, can't you, Herringbone? Certainly, sire, said the chief advisor. And if I may ask, are you planning to visit the seamstress's family at all? They live, you know, just a short walk from the palace gates. Visit them, said the king pensively. Oh no, Herringbone, I don't think I'd like... I mean to say, I'm sure they aren't expecting that. Herringbone and the king looked at each other for a few seconds. Then the chief advisor bowed and left the room. Now, as King Fred was used to everyone telling him what a marvelous chap he was, he really didn't like the frown with which the chief advisor had left. He now began to feel cross rather than ashamed. It's a bally pity, he told his reflection, turning back to the mirror in which he'd been combing his mustaches before bed. But after all, I'm the king, and she was a seamstress. If I died, I wouldn't have expected her to... But then it occurred to him that if he died, he'd expect the whole of Cornucopia to stop whatever they were doing, dress all in black, and weep for a week. Just as they'd done for his father, Richard the Righteous. Well, anyway, he said impatiently to his reflection, life goes on. He put on his silk nightcap, climbed into the four-poster bed, blew out the candle, and fell asleep.